I think we'll probably, well, I shouldn't say. I shouldn't say. I think we'll probably finish Midsummer Night's <coughs> Dream today, unless I get too bogged up, bogged down on the. Next thing. <coughs> this doesn't count, by the way. I'm just trying to get faces to names as much as I can because my brain's mush. Okay, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 3, Scene 2, the book I have, page 169. We've just seen the, the lover's quarrel, is where we left off last week. Puck and Oberon come forward, and Oberon just rips Puck. He says, you did this on purpose, sorry, King of Shadows, entirely unintentional, but I do love to see these, you know, Foolish mortals, as he calls them, he calls them at one point, fight. So, Oberon says, 354, Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. High, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The story welcome, cover thou anon, blah, blah, blah. Make it pitch dark. Get them all together in the same space. I don't care how you do it. Just do it, okay? Three down to 363, and from each other look thou lead them thus till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep then crush this herb into Lysander or herb into Lysander's eye. And he gives them the herb, okay? Whose liquor hath this virtuous proper tie to take from thence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. Wanted, as they used to before. What does he want to do to Lysander? Restore his love for Hermia. Restore his love for Hermia, okay? When they next awake, all this derision. What is derision? I don't know if you have a gloss down there. Laughable business, okay, that's one way of looking at it. What do you do when you deride somebody? Insult. You insult them, okay? It, it, it has to deal, partially at least, with reason, okay? Uh, just for the second. reason. Right, the reason. Hannah? Hatred. Hatred, sorry. Mm-hmm. Still trying. Um, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision. Because a dream and fruitless vision lacks what? Reason, rationality. Again, where are they? Middle of the woods. The, the place of unreason, the place of irrationality, the place where nothing seemingly makes sense. And where's the greatest demonstration of that? Within the play. Well, we talked about between Hamlet and Hamlet, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, possibly. But within that scene, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, just if, if Hermia really believes, excuse me, if Helena really believes she's being made fun of by all three, wouldn't it make sense for her to take offense at that? And if Hermia thinks Helena has stolen her boyfriend, Yes, she's gonna well. Yes, she's gonna fight for him. Okay, where else? Where do we see the real derision, the lack of rationality, the lack of reason? Who falls in love with Bottom? Goddess, essentially, with a ass-headed man, something that's neither ass nor human. Definitely not fairy, right? totally doesn't make any sense, okay? So, all this will seem a dream and fruitless vision. That is, a vision that doesn't have any bearing results, consequences in reality. Because there are other, quote unquote, visions that can, right? Prophetic visions, premonitions, those are all taken to be real. If someone has a vision, and what that person sees and mentions to somebody else actually happens, people kind of go, you know, 
cue the Twilight Zone music, okay? And back to Athens shall the lovers wind with league whose date till death shall never end. Lines 372 and 373. So, Oberon is saying, the lovers will leave from here. Wind means turn. They'll turn back. Notice what's another phrase for that? To turn around. To go in the direction opposite to where you've been going. They'll repent. That's what repent literally means. To do a 180. Okay? They'll go back to what? To the place of reason, rationality. What did bottom say about love these days it in reason don't go hand in hand but they should so when Oberon does this we're going to see reason and love seemingly working together okay notice back to Athens the lovers shall uh, shall the lovers win with league whose day till death shall never end. With league, with comity, with, they'll be in league together till death do them part. Because what has already been repaired? Who does Demetrius now love? Who did Demetrius love? We were told in the opening scene before the play began originally. Helena. And then he ditched Helena for Hermia. The implication is, when he falls in love with Hermia, what happens to his eyes? He's not seeing properly. It's going to be called, or it's already been called, misprision. Like, he's got a speck in his eye, so he can't see properly. Well, he's got to get that speck out so he can see properly. When the love juice was put in his eyes, and she was the first thing he saw, now he loves properly. So, he says, meanwhile, so, whilst I in this affair do thee employ, this is what you're going to do, meanwhile, I'm going to go to my queen and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. Remember, what I have over here, the tragic pyramid, and the inversion of that for comedy. How does a comedy end? For the most part, but the rupture in society is, is fixed, it's restored. So Puck says, okay, talk about how fast I'll go. They start to talk about light coming. And Oberon, but we are spirits of another sort. I with the morning's love, how oft made sport, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, Lysander comes in. Oberon leaves. He's got to go find Titania. Oberon leaves. Lysander comes in. Just spitting mad. He's ready to fight Demetrius to the death. Okay? So, Puck mimics Demetrius and leads Lysander all around. Demetrius comes in, Puck mimics Lysander, so he's got them following one another in a sense because they can't see each other, right? So when, when Puck makes the world go dark, does the theater go dark? No. Do it with your mind's eye. Let your mind go into derision, so to speak, because what does every play, what does watching every play and every film involve? Suspension of disbelief. Okay? Which is what makes, when we get to it, the, the play within the play, the play of Pyramids and Thisbe, so rip-roaringly funny. Because the actor is putting on that play, don't understand anything about it. Make believe. They think they're really going to scare the women to death, and so we get these comments. Okay? So, Puck leads them all around. We're going to sk skip all of that. And he gets them to fall asleep and lie down. So we have Hermia next to whom? 
Lysander, and probably facing each other. And we have Demetrius and Helena facing each other, okay? Unaware that the other is there. So when they told, they think they're alone, all right? Act four, scene one, still in the wood. Catania comes in with her followers and Bottom. Bottom's asking, you know, for the little fairies to bring him things and such. <clears throat> We're going to skip a bunch. Catania falls asleep. We're told, line 39, Sleep thou and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies be gone and be always away. And then we hear her say, so doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle, gently entwist. The female ivy so enrings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee. Oh, how I dote on thee. What's the imagery she's giving us? Go out in the woods somewhere, and you will often see trees or bushes, shrubs, with these vines, wild honeysuckle, that grows around them. And they are so intertwined, if you try to pull one, you pull both. That's how she and Bottom are going to sleep. There's no separating them, okay? So, Puck comes in. And notice, Oberon comes forward. Why? Oberon has been on the stage during that. He's standing towards the back, probably, maybe hiding behind one of the curtains that sometimes um, conceals the doors, okay? Puck enters the stage. And Oberon says, Seest thou this sweet sight? Sweet how? That's a pretty good image of love right there. Okay? What, how else does sweet mean? Sweet to whom? Oberon. He's gotten to Tanya to do, not release the boy, but to fall in love with the worst possible thing she could. Okay? Kind of fits his goal of what he wanted to happen, okay? Her dotage, now I do begin to pity. There's that word dotage again. We've heard it several times, okay? Helena doting, 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 we're told in that opening scene on Demetrius. It seems to be a theme, an important idea that Shakespeare wants to convey, because doting implies Lack of reason. It's caring beyond what is rational or what is appropriate. Okay? For Dotage, now I do begin to pity for Lord, meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool. I did upbraid, upbraid her and fall out with her. For she has hairy temples in and round, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So he says he taunted her. She begged his patience. I then did ask of her changeling child, which straight she gave me. <coughs> Why did she give it to him? Her reason has become overwhelmed by what? Her passion. According to ancient Greek theory, up through early Christian, you know, church and stuff, through the Middle Ages. The body's divided into three, or human faculties are divided into three. You have re reason, rationality, you have appetite, passions, and the will. The will is the thing that does the bidding of the reason. And the reason is up here for a reason, top down. This should control everything else, okay? but her passions are governing her now. He asks something, and her passions, not responding to reason, all she wants is to make bottom it. Sure, you can have what, just go away. Let us get back to our business, okay? So he says, and now I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eye, and gentle puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he, awaking when the other do, may all to Athens back again repair. And think no more of this night's X 
said dense. I had it written on the board the other day, but we didn't talk about it. But it's spelled that way and not this way, which is a different thing, but because it sounds the same for the most part. How about if you hear someone say accidents and accidents, like I just did, homicides, right? Think no more of this night's accidents, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. That is the accidents, the coincidental things that occurred in the forest are the what? They're the vexation. Is that what he said? Vexation of a dream. They're the what is resulting from a dream. We're already beginning to get into all of this stuff. Shakespeare is kind of gently leading his audience because one of the themes of this play is that thing I put up on the board the other day. Appearance versus reality. What is real? The Velveteen Rabbit asked one day. Read the story, by the way. <coughs> So, they will think everything that happened just a dream, and it vexed them. What is something that is vexing? Irritating. Puzzling. Because irritating can be different than puzzling. Puzzling is, mm, you want to find out about it. And you try and you try and you try, and it still vexes you. It still, you know, just stays just beyond your reach. Reach, apprehend, okay? <clears throat> so, he squeezes the other herb in her eye, the herb that removes the effect of love and idleness, and says, be as thou wast wont to be. Be as you used to be. See as thou wast wont to see. See as you used to see. Used to win. Before he puts the love and idleness in her eyes? How did she see immediately before he did that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fairies, skip hints. We do not share the bed anymore. Not that kind. See as she was wont to see means before the little changeling boy broke their relationship. Now, the little changeling boy did nothing. It was the mere fact that he existed, and Oberon wanted him, and she wanted him. The word wanted there implies which of those three faculties that I was talking about? Reason, will, or passion? Passion. Passion. It's desire. Okay? See as I was want to see Diane's bud over Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now my Titania, wake you my sweet queen, my Oberon. Notice his last word, my sweet queen, my Oberon. My my implies what? We have a marriage. Of, we have a marriage, a real marriage. Okay. What visions have I seen? He thought I was enamored of an ass. Okay, where is she at this point? Physically describe her on the stage. In bed. She and Bottom are still all wrapped up like some image from the Kama Sutra. I mean, it's you got a bunch of people to pull them apart. She's looking at her husband, at Oberon, and she says, I thought I was enamored of an ass. He goes, there lies your love. And I've seen productions, you know, where sometimes bottom is over here and she's here. Shakespeare, that's easy to understand it that way. But he could just as easily go um, and gently turn her face. And there's bottom, head of an ass, you know, right there. How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. 
Has bottom been retransformed back into bottom? Not yet. Then he goes, shh, silent for a while. <laughs> Why? A little bit of reality possibly intrudes. How's he going to explain this? <laughs> Maybe another potion to help the medicine go down, so to speak. Robin, take off this head. To Tanya, music call. She calls some music. Puck removes the head. Now when thou wakes with thine own fool's eyes peep. Okay. So Oberon says, as they dance, now thou and I are new in amity, friendship, line 87, and will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance into Theseus' house triumphantly. So three days have gone by. Tomorrow is the fourth day, new moon, weddings, and or possibly, according to what Theseus and, and Aegeus are thinking, possibly a death or a young girl being sent off to the nunnery and such. These, uh, Oberon knows otherwise. And bless it all to fair prosperity. There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus at all in Jolly. Notice, Titania doesn't know who he's talking about other than Theseus and Hippolyta, okay? So, the fairies all leave. Who's left on the stage? The four lovers. All, all the stuff with Oberon and Titania and the fairies in that scene was around the four lovers. Theseus and Aegeus come in, okay? With Hippolyta and such. And Theseus sees the sleepers. What nymphs are these? Obviously, talking about Helena and Hermia. Aegeus, my lord, this is my daughter, and Lysander, and this is Demet. And I wonder of their being here together. I wonder means he is filled with wonder. Why? Because they look peaceful. You, know, you don't see any blood marks, you don't see any wounds. Theseus, no doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May. Does that mean the story is set in the place set in May? No, it's a midsummer night's dream. The rite of May doesn't only have to be performed on May 1st. It's a romantic ritual, okay? So, Theseus bids the huntsmen wake them up. They all stand after kneeling. And he says, I know you two are rival enemies. Demetrius, Lysander, what's up? How comes this gentle concord in the world? What does concord mean? Anybody know what it literally means? Co, cord, cur, card. One heart. Co means together or with. Hearts together. Like accord. To one heart is what an accord means. So, how comes this gentle concord in the world that hatred is so far from jealousy? To sleep by hate and fear no enmity. Lysander, I shall apply, reply amazedly. Amazement. That is without reason. If you're amazed at something, your reason is overwhelmed. Half sleep, half waking. So if you're half waking, what's, you're not awake. If you're half asleep, you're not fully yet. You're in what? You're in that liminal space between. I don't know how I came here. Oh, that's right. Hermie and I came here to get married. Outside Athenian law. And Jesus is like, that's it. That's enough. The law. Apply the law. So Demetrius kind of steps forth. He says, Helena told me of their stealth, and I in fury follow, followed them. Fair, notice, fair Helena. And fancy, fancy meaning imagination, fantasy. That is, she had hopes and dreams. 
But my good Lord, I wot, that means know. I know not by what power, but by some power it is my love to Hermia melted as the snow. Seems to me now as the remembrance of an idle god. What's a god? What is someone who's gaudy? Here, I'll give you a musician. Elton John. Over the top. Yeah, over the top. Dressing, you know, it'd be like, and I've had this happen before, it'd be like one of you, one of you guys coming in with a tux. Not with, wearing a tux. <laughs> I had a, uh, a female student come in one day, what looked like a bridal gown? Well, it turns out she was in design. Okay, And I think it was a <laughs> bridal gown. <laughs> that would be gaudy for this environment. He says, my love for her melted as the remembrance of an idol god. That is, if someone comes in wearing gaudy clothing, what does it do to you? It draws your eyes to it. That's why I mentioned Elton John. You know, it's like every concert, what's he gonna wear now, you know? Which in my childhood, I did, and there it is again, dote upon. Why childhood? Because children and adults are supposed to see the world differently. Children get fascinated by old adult, stupid little things. Look at this great rock. It's a rock. Dad, look at this bottle cap going on a hike or something. It's trash. Put it down. You don't know where. Right? It draws their attention. And he dotes, he doted upon her as a child, and all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. Okay, notice, the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and pleasure of my eye is Helena. To her, my Lord, was I betrothed. Oh, see, we didn't hear that before. All we heard was that he wooed Helena. They were engaged, he says before I saw Hermia. But like a sickness did I loathe this food. Why like a sickness? The food was healthy for him. But the sickness said, I can't eat that. But as in health come to my natural taste, now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forever be true to it. Theseus, fair lovers. Fair means beautiful. You are fortunately met. Why fortunately? Nobody has to die. Nobody has to die. What else? What does fortune mean? Good luck. Good luck. Good luck smiled down upon you. Mm, not really. Because fortunately comes from fortune and ultimately history of Western thought, the goddess Fortuna who, according to a writer like Boethius, 6th century Roman statesman, philosopher, theologian, pretty much general walking, talking encyclopedia Britannica, fortune governs, governs things down here. Okay? She's usually depicted, and we'll see this in other plays, as having a wheel. And the wheel always turns. You want to be on this side of fortune's wheel. You never want to get to the top. Because once you're at the top, boom, the wheel turns quickly. Down here is where life sucks and then you die. Okay, pretty, pretty bleak. That's exactly where it comes from. Okay. So, you're fortunately met, he says, I want to hear more about this later, but, nah, Aegeus, I overbear your will. Your will. What does the Aegeus want? The law. Nope. He says, these two couples are going to get married with us. Notice, have they said anything about we're going to get married? Maybe it's going to shack up for mm, Nope. They're getting married with us. Okay? Theseus, Apollo, to all the others leave. Hold your finger there for a moment and go back, because there's something I forgot to mention. with
in the opening scene, Act One, Scene One. It's after. It's right when Theseus says to Demetrius and Aegeus, "Come with me. I need to talk to you both." Um, he addresses Hermia, line one seventeen, Act One, Scene One, line one seventeen, and following. After he tells Aegeus, "I have some private schooling for you both," or to Aegeus and Demetrius. He says, for you, fair Hermia, look, you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate to death or to a vow of single life. <coughs> Come, my Hippolyta. What's the next line? What cheer, my love? What does what cheer, my love, mean? Is there a gloss down there? No, good. It could mean that if it said be cheered or be cheerful or be cheery. What? You're getting to it. The what cheer implies what's wrong with your face? Because you know someone is cheery by their face. He's like, what's that look? Now, I think that's a stage direction on Shakespeare's part. He's telling. The person who plays Hippolyta, you need to give kind of a look of consternation after this little speech, okay? If Hippolyta were to defend anybody, who's she gonna defend? The women. Why? She's an Amazon and a queen. I mean, if, if you wanna talk feminism in Shakespeare, proto-feminism, whatever terminology, She's it. She's the ideal of that, right? And what has her soon-to-be husband just said? And couple that with how he begins his speech. I won the how. With love tokens and songs the way Demetrius and Lysander do their women. Mm. I wooed thee with my sword. I defeated you in battle. It's like she is a spoil of war. I don't mean she's being forced to marry him. It's pretty clear her will has chosen this. It could be, as often happened in wars in the Middle Ages and earlier, as a means of restoring peace between the two warring groups. Okay? But I think the what cheer, my love, go back there for just a second. Demetrius and Aegeus go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves, okay? I think she has given him a look, and I've seen this stage a couple different ways. The National Shakespeare Festival did this really good in one of their productions. When he says, come, Hippolyta, she's already turned to leave. Why? She doesn't like what she has just heard. Because now Hermia is being forced against her will to do one of three things. Notice, her will will never be fulfilled, according to what Theseus has just said. Okay? Back to where we were. So, Theseus and Hippolyta, they all leave. Everybody's going to be happy now. And the four lovers are still there. And Demetrius says, line 185 or so. These things seem small and undistinguishable, like far-off mountains turned into clods. What things? The difficulties, what the, their, their experiences in the wood. Hermia, methinks I see these things with parted eye. Improperly focused, your gloss tells you. That is, like, part of my eye sees. It's like, you know, she's wearing bifocals, or trifocals in this case. Okay. Some things clear, some things not clear, some things eh, little. When everything seems double, like he was in love with me, now he's in love with her. I was looking for this. There's two situations, like they've got doppelgangers going around. Helena, yeah, me too. 
And I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. Demetrius, are you sure we're awake? Like, go up and pinch each other. Seems to me that we, that yet we sleep, we dream. Notice that verb, seems. What kind of verb is that? Oh, why do I always do this and then I always forget the verb? Present tense. Say that again? Uh, it is present tense. I mean, the kind, it's um, mm -hmm. subjunctive. Subjunctive. It's a subjunctive. It's not indicative. He goes to the store. It seems it's a subjunctive because it indicates a condition contrary to fact. Okay? It seems that yet we sleep. Notice, they're not asleep. But he's kind of thinking, are we sure we're not still in the dream? Is the dream still going on? Because how does it seem? Seems perfect now. How often, maybe I'm the only one. How often have you, have you had a dream and you started waking up and you're going like, no, 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 no. Because what seemed to be perfection, and then you wake up and you know, you're by yourself in Peck Hall, you know. Uh -huh. Not perfection. MPS used uh, pan to brutalism. Horribly ugly word. Um, yet we sleep, we dream. Wasn't the Duke just here? Didn't he tell us before? Yeah, my father too. And we're going to get married in the temple. Yep. So they all leave. Bottom wakes up. Bottom gets one of Shakespeare's great comedic speeches. He wakes up and what's he thinking? He's not thinking anything about what has happened the last couple days. He's back in rehearsing for the play. And he realizes, 203, I have had a dream. I've had a most rare vision. I've had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Notice that, past the wit of man to say what a dream it was. Past the wit, the intelligence. I can't explain it. Now that's good use of language. Me thought I was, there's no man can tell. What? Right? Because have you ever seen somebody walking around with the head of an ass and the body of a human? Hmm, doesn't happen. He can't put that into words. There's no explanation. Methought I was and methought I had, but man is but a patched fool if he'll offer to say what methought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. Eyes don't hear. He's paraphrasing, by the way, St. Paul. The eye of man hath not erred, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand, lost my place, is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. And that tells us bottom is back. Because bottom is a clueless dolt. Except when it comes to weaving. And he's a master at weaving. So he says, I gotta find Peter Quince. And he'll put what I dreamed in a prologue, okay? For scene two, we're back in Athens, okay? Bottom finds the others. He tells them kind of what happened, alludes to it at the very least. Five, one, okay? They find out, by the way, the end of four, scene two, their play is preferred. They're going to be putting on a production for the Duke and Queen for their wedding. So, 5-1. Theseus, Hippolyta, and all the others come in. Hippolyta. Tis strange, my Theseus, that these love to speak. So, they're entering the stage talking. And what we hear they're talking about is what the lovers have been talking about. Just listen to this speech, and then we're going to take it apart for probably too long. I find this to be one of the most amazing speeches in all of Shakespeare. And it's got criticism on it. It doesn't have the criticism that I think it deserves. 
more strange than true. So she said, tis strange that these lovers speak of. More strange than true. What does he mean by strange? What does she mean by strange? Weird. Thank you for using weird. What's weird? Abnormal. Unexpected, out of the realm of possibility. Curious could be your response to it. Did you, you did say curious, right? Well, I mean, like, more of the way Chester Hart uses it, like curiouser and curious. Curiouser and curiouser. In other words, to follow that metaphor, you go farther and farther down the rabbit hole into Wonderland, okay? More strange than true. True implies what? Now, again, you have to take away your 21st century understanding of the world. My opinion, our 21st century understanding has gone deeper and deeper down the, down the rabbit hole than they ever dreamed of. Because what has he just said? More strange than true. That implies there is truth. And truth meant what? Like in Shakespeare's day or back to the ancient Greeks. Correspondence between what one says about reality and reality itself. In other words, this case is hard. I could come up, hit you on the forehead with it, and you would say, yes, it is hard. Okay? And it's also real. Would have been none of the ideas prevalent today. There are a lot of people that, that says this isn't real. I mean, there's scientists talking about are we all living in a simulation? I mean, serious. Physicist after physicist, the matrix is real, in other words. Okay? More strange than true. Why? Because Theseus's worldview can't account for something this inexplicable. So he goes on. I'm going to read the whole thing and then start. I never may believe these antic, notice my pronunciation, antic fables nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold that is the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear. So, lovers and madmen have si such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. So he's just connected, compared, lovers and madmen. Why do they have shaping fantasies? What's the cause of the shaping fantasies? The line above. They have such seething brains. Seething's a verb. What does it mean? Louder? Keep going. What does roiling mean? It, you're right. It, they're both referring to the same action. Turbulence a little different, because you can talk about turbulence like air turbulence when you're in a plane. That's not seething or roiling. Boiling, right? Bingo. It's the turbulence of boiling water, the bubbles, what's happening. The bottom's coming up to the top and flowing back down. Seething <coughs> brains our brains boiling, okay? Lovers and madmen. 
What happens when your temperature rises too high? Like 104, 105, 106. Hallucinate. People hallucinate. Now, most of us say they, say they see things that aren't there. Some say, hmm, maybe they see things better than the rest of us do. Mystics and such. So, deceiving brains, the boiling, boiling brains cause the shaping fantasies. What do the shaping fantasies do? That apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. What's the difference between apprehension and comprehension? Not apprehensive, apprehension. They're different, yet they have the same root. Well, what's comprehension or comprehending? It's understanding. What's apprehending? You don't talk about a cop comprehending a suspect. They apprehend. They take hold of. Okay? So, lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend. They reach out. They take hold of. They grasp more than cool reason ever comprehends. Notice what Shakespeare through Theseus is saying the lovers and madmen's brains do. They take hold of things that reason what? Fails to or that reason cannot understand. That's why, you know, the one day I brought in, I, I mentioned, you know, when I first saw the woman who would become my wife, I went and immediately got a yellow pad, pros and cons. No. And I, I mean, I'm one of those, one, this is one of those instances. I literally saw her, hadn't spoken to her, and thought, I'm going to marry her. Creepy, you know, all that stuff. And now he has another one. So that was Mad Men and Lovers. The lunatic, madman, lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. That is, all the same, made of the same stuff, imagination. Why do you think Shakespeare throws in, or Theseus throws in the poet? I mean, you have to be a little wild to be a thinking you might translate the poet to. I think this is Shakespeare's self-justification. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, he wrote a justification, and I can't remember the title of it, it's a little essay in the collection on poems and other things, um, for his spending years creating vocabularies of people that never lived, in creating grammars of languages that no one ever spoke. Because for him, all those cultures, peoples, Middle Earth, up here, all real. And he realized you can't have a real culture unless that culture has a language, and that culture's language can't be real unless it has a history, unless there were people that actually spoke it. That's why he started writing the stories that would ultimately become the Lord of the Rings, Silmarillion, because he'd already started working on these invented languages, just languages, okay? Total linguistic nerd. So, lunatic lover and the poet are imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That's the lunatic. Why are there more devils than vast hell can hold? Hold, because the lunatic sees them all around. Okay? That's the madman. The lover, all as frantic. What is somebody who is frantic? Crazed, Crazed nervous, jumpy, you know. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. What does that mean? Helen, first of all. The face that launched a thousand ships, according to Chapman's translation of Homer. All right? 
Chapman, contemporary slightly earlier than Shakespeare. Who is Helen of Troy? The wife of, not Agamemnon, but his brother. Starts with Menelaus. She gets captured by Paris of Troy, okay? According to the Disneyfied version of it. She runs off with Paris of Troy, her lover, ditches her husband. He runs to his big brother, big brother, Agamemnon, king of the Aegeans. Um, and they launch the Trojan War to bring Helen back. Okay? Great two epics come out of it, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Helen's Greek. She's olive-skinned. In a brow of Egypt? That's dark-skinned. Not sub-Saharan African dark skin. Northern, North Saharan, like the modern Egyptian. Okay. There's a big row over Cleopatra. Who should portray Cleopatra? There's a new Netflix series or something, and they've gotten a black actress to portray her. Because a lot of uh, black scholars argue Cleopatra ought to be black. Cleopatra was Greek, not African literally descended from Greeks who invaded and took over northern Africa, okay? So, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt means sees the ideal of beauty in a dark-skinned woman. What's he saying? That's irrational. That doesn't make sense. Again, in Shakespeare's day, the model of beauty is, if I can find it, let's find one somewhere. I can't find one. Totally white. White. That white. Look at every painting of Queen Elizabeth. And she is white like this sheet of paper is white. That's the ideal. Okay? One of Shakespeare's sonnets, My Mistress's Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun takes all the ideals of beauty and flips them on their head. He uses what's called an anti-blazon. The blazon is the catalog of beauties. Look at her forehead, it's white, her beautiful eyes, her blonde hair, her rosy cheeks, her red lips, her perfect white smooth teeth, etc. That's the blazon of beauty. Shakespeare takes all that, turns it on its head, okay? So, the lover, all as frantic, as crazy, seething brain, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and does what? And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, right? The imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Where does that begin? in George Lucas's mind. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote in a student's blue book, entrance exams to Oxford, summer of 1931, I think it was. He was sitting in his garage study, study over the garage, window open, fresh air blowing through. I've, I've held this in my hands. He turns the page, blank sheet, and just writes, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit, and goes on, creates the rest. He had no idea what a hobbit was. He'd never heard or seen the word before. And so he starts writing a story for what reason? To give the form of thing unknown a shape and habitation and a name, okay? Such tricks have strong imagination. 
that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. See, and I think everything to that point is building to that statement. Because that is a deep <laughs> statement about reality. Substance, accidents. We talked about substance, the essence of a thing. Accidents or accidents, it's appearance. Appearance versus reality. We got to stop here. Not literally. Um, Plato, in his dialogues, supposedly, you know, dialogues of Socrates with others, most scholars think most of those are actually Plato and not Socrates, has in the Republic the allegory of the cave. Okay? And what he's getting at with the allegory of the cave is what is really real. What is reality? Okay. Plato and his student, Aristotle, so you had Socrates was Plato's teacher, Plato was Aristotle's teacher. Aristotle, anybody know whose teacher he was? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Okay. Not a bad set of you know influences on old uh, young Alexander. Plato and his student Aristotle argued as to what is the nature of reality, what is really real. There's a famous patient, uh, painting by Michael it's either no, it's either Raphael or Titian of the School of Athens, and you have Plato standing there, old white beard, white hair, finger pointing upwards. And you have Aristotle, younger, dark hair, hand down like this. Plato saying what's real is what's out there. Aristotle saying what's real is only what we can see here. We can't know what is out there except by examining everything down here to make assumptions about what's up there. So, the allegory of the cave. Skip this for a moment. So here's, here's the sun, okay, out there. I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. This is the surface, so to speak, of the world. And here's the cave entrance. And he takes you down into this cave. And in this cave, the first thing you see when you go down in is there's a big fire at one point. You keep going down, you go around that fire, and beneath that fire, on a level spot, are people walking, carrying poles. And all those poles are images. Tree image, person image, all kinds of images. Bottle image, phone image, marker image, glasses case image. They're carrying all these things. Notice, these people are walking like in a trench, because here's a wall that hides them. So the flames create light. The light hits these things that they're carrying and project shadows on this back wall, okay? Behind this wall that separates these people carrying their things are other people chained to seats change so that they're like this. All they can do is look forward. They can't turn their heads. They can't turn around. They might hear something, but because they can't see it, they don't know that it's real. Their only experience of quote unquote reality is what they see ahead of them. What do they see ahead of them? Shadows on the wall. Shadows. Plato's point is, we are in chains. All that we see are shadows. C.S. Lewis referred to them as, it as the shadow lands. This is a land of shadow. And if it's shadow, what does that mean? It's the image of something or, to go back, it's the image of something that really exists out there. Okay. Lovers of Mad Men have C. 
seeding brains that make such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. Go back down. The poet's eye that glanced from heaven. Notice, the poet's eye glanced us from heaven to earth first, not earth to heaven. All right? And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. See, these people here, us, what's out here is unknown. Even what's here is unknown. The only way we know anything about this is because of the shadows that we see around us. And this is where you get the idea of Plato's forms and copies, or ideals, or ideas. Like the idea of a bottle. Is this the shape of every bottle? No, it's not. It embodies bottleness. How so? What does every bottle have? Some kind of lid cap, okay? And what does every bottle do? <laughs> What's its purpose or for function? Container. It's a container of, this has liquid. Does a bottle have to have liquid? Well, it could have something solid, okay? What about, can't use that one, one of these. Chair. Chair, it's got chair in it. What does that mean? Which are? You can sit on it. You can sit on it. But you can sit on a table too. But you can sit on a table too. And you can sit on a stool that has three legs. This has four legs. So does a chair have to have four legs? Does a chair have to have a back? Do all chairs have backs? <laughs> Do all chairs have, I have no idea what you call this thing. You know, backs that move? No, that one doesn't. So these, this is why Aristotle said, we can't know what's up there until we look at everything, till we examine every instance of chair down here. And only then can we get at what a chair really is, what its real form is, okay? Now look at the end of Theseus's little speech there. So the poet's pen turns the, the, the forms of things unknown in the poet's mind. It turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing, right? Because it's up here. If Tolkien had never written anything, we would never know anything about Frodo and the Lord of the Rings and Bilbo and etc. Harry Potter would only exist in J.K. Rowling's mind. It gives to Airy nothing a local habitation and a name. In other words, Athens, the wood. Such tricks have strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, and this is why I said this, this is the nub of this little speech. If it would apprehend some joy, if it would grab hold of some joy, what? Does Theseus say, the imagination then says? So if the imagination can take hold of some joy, there must be what? If it takes hold of it, it's got to be real. And there must be some bringer of that joy. In other words, joy doesn't just exist on its own. There has to be something behind it. Okay? Now, when you stop to think about that, that is so pretty damn deep, you can't ever really delve it. You can't get to the bottom of it. Because Shakespeare is kind of saying, if you have an idea of something, a joy, then what? Where's that idea come from? Someday. Something brought that to you. Hamlet's going to say, I could be a king of infinite space bounded up in a nutshell. Okay, now just take that image for a moment. A king of infinite space 
expound it in a nutshell. We would say that, wait a second, that's, that's a logical contradiction. How could it be infinite space bounded in a nutshell? How can the universe be expanding? Just think about that for a moment. Every physicist says the universe is expanding. It's expanding at a constant rate. It's called the Hubble constant. It's 300,000 miles per second, something like that. From the Big Bang, boom, it's going out at, okay, it's the universe. What's outside it? <laughs> space? Mm, space is part of the universe. Space, according to the physicists, was created by boom. So what's it moving into? I could be a king of infinite space, bounded in a nutshell. And then Hamlet says, were it not for bad dreams? What's his point? Where do bad dreams come from? Your mind. Do they? Because if you're a king of infinite space, bounded in this, how do they come from within? Hamlet, Shakespeare's raising the question, where do these ideas come from? How come J.K. Rowling, at one moment, knew nothing about Harry Potter, and literally a minute later, a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were murdered by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived, who is also after him. One idea, one moment, nothing. Next moment, idea that makes her a billionaire within 10 years. And within 15 years, the richest woman in the United Kingdom, more wealthy than Queen Elizabeth. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. The essay he was reading had nothing to do with hobbits. Where did it come from? Shakespeare is wrestling with poetic inspiration. Where even that term gives it away. Where does inspiration come from? It's inspired. It comes from without. Where? People have been wrestling with this question for over 2,500 years, okay? If it apprehends some joy, the joy is the shadow or copy. It comprehends some bringer of that joy. In other words, the real thing. If there is some joy, then there's got to be something bringing that joy. There, in other words, everything that, that I've been saying gets to what? Another phrase from Hamlet. There's more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. There's more than what we see, what we know, okay? And Hippolyta kind of demonstrates exactly what I've been saying. What is Theseus saying? Surface level. This is all a bunch of hooey. What they're saying is not true. Mass psychosis, mass hallucination. Hippolyta destroys that. But all the story of the night told over and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancies images, it grows to something of great constancy. Mm, no, I don't think so, honey. There's, they can't all have had the exact same dream. There's something else there, okay? So, they go on, and we hear them argue back and forth about the play. Theseus says, I want to hear the play about Pyramus and Thisbe. Line 82, I will hear that play. Philostrate has said, the guy's doing this, you know, they're idiots. They will not be able to do it. For never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Never Anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. So what's he mean by simpleness? Does he mean they're simpletons? These guys are IQs 80? No. Simpleness, I think there means sincerity. They really mean to do a good job. And they feel a duty to him. Okay? Hippolytus says, no, 
I love not to see wretchedness overcharged and duty in his service perishing. You won't see that. He says they can't do this. He says, the kinder we, that is, then we must be kinder. Why or how? To give them thanks for nothing. She says, Philostrate or philosophy says they can do nothing in this. They can't pull this play off. So he says, well, then we'll have to show what? How kind we are. How? To thank them. What do you usually thank somebody for? They've done or said something. Nice. Opened the door, gave you a drink, off, whatever. He says, we must thank them for what? Nothing. Our sport, our recreation in this, shall be to take what they mistake. We shall intend what they don't intend, in other words. Or we shall intend, actually take that back, what they do intend. We will give them credit for having totally screwed up. Why? Because they tried in the first place. And what poor duty cannot do, noble respect, takes it in might, not merit. And I think the might means might have been, or in what they were able to do. A parent of a young child, the child draws something, scribbles with crayons, Look, Daddy, or look, Mommy. A good parent says what? It's beautiful. That's lovely. And a smart parent then says, what is it? <laughs> so that the child tells you what it is before you say, that's a beautiful cloud. No, Daddy, that's your face. <laughs> you know, well, screwed that one up. A bad parent says what? That's ugly. You didn't keep within the lines. You didn't. So he gives an example of what he's talking about. Where I have come, meaning where I, Duke Theseus, leader of all of these myths, or, or chief character in all of these myths and stories, great clerks have purposed to greet me with premeditated welcome. People have been charged to read a speech where I have seen them shiver and look pale make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practice accent in their ears, and in conclusion dumbly have broke off not to aim me a welcome. They've gotten so choked up by the pomposity of the situation or the, the greatness of the person they are speaking, they can't say anything. Trust me, sweet, out of the silence, yet I picked a welcome. Back when I used, used to listen to talk radio, people would call in the various, you know, talk radio people, and they'd get through after being after waiting for two or three hours. And the host would say something, and they're like, just, just take a breath, calm down. A good host calm the person says, Now, what do you have on your mind? But they're so tied up knowing 20 million people are listening. You know? You see that happen. People who meet a president or the pope or whatever. And in the modesty of fearful duty, I read as much from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity in least speak most to my capacity. That is, the love of the person who is addressing me, respect, honor, dignity, and what else? Tongue-tied simplicity. He says, do what? Those are the things that speak to me. Whether or not the person could pull it off is totally irrelevant. What has Theseus just told us to do about the play within the play? Give it credit. It's important. Give it credit. It's important. Why? They're doing the best they can. Right? which turns out to be rip-roaringly funny. So we hear them talk, we hear the prologue. I'm not going to go through the prologue, but the prologue is entirely wrong in its punctuation. 
it's punctuated according to how Peter Quince delivers it. It's not punctuated according to grammatical sense. And it's telling us he just totally botched the whole prologue. He makes the prologue mean the opposite of what it should mean. Example, gentles, perhaps you wonder, perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus. Um, take that back. Go back. Line 107 or 108, something like that. If we offend, it is with our good will. So, so that means we mean to offend you. It's not what he means. <laughs> if we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend. That is what he means. But he doesn't keep respect to what Theseus called points, stops. See, punctuation has two purposes. We only talk about one purpose today, grammar, grammatical construction. That's why, you know, papers get ripped apart because of comma splices. What is the cardinal sin of a comma splice? What are you doing? when you write a comma splice. Anybody? Have you ever heard this? You're joining together two independent clauses with a comma. What do you use to join two independent clauses? Semicolon. Semicolon or a conjunction or a comma and a conjunction. Otherwise, you've done the dreaded deed, you know, a comma splice. In Shakespeare's day, not the case. Shakespeare's day, you could punctuate grammatically or you could punctuate oratorically. That is, for the purpose of pauses, that is the original purpose of punctuation. For the purpose of pauses while reading. Why? Because you can't just keep reading something without ever <gasps> taking a breath. When writing first began, take it back, among the Greeks, fourth century in BC and later, because that's when punctuation began. It was designed because reading was always allowed. Silent reading didn't start until second half of the first millennium AD. Probably not till about 900 or 1000 AD. Maybe a little bit early. So reading was allowed. If you're reading aloud, what do you have to do? You got to take breaths. You got to know when to pause. A comma is a short pause. Take a, take a breath, go on. Semicolon, slightly longer pause. A period, take a drink, wet your whistle, go on. Paragraphs, you know, don't get into the scene until much later. You pick up an ancient Greek text or an ancient Latin text, they're all just written right straight across the page. No sentence divisions. Old English texts are written that way, okay? So, they do the play. The play is totally botched. Bottom gets the best lines, especially after he kills himself, finding Pyramus, uh, after finding Thisbe dead, he thinks. And what do we see him do? We hear out, line 292, I'm trying to finish this. Out sword and wound the path of Pyramus, I that left path. So he pulls out his sword, stabs himself, left side of the chest. I that left path where the heart doth hop, thus die I. Thus, thus, thus. That's four more stab wounds. That's what the thus means. Now am I dead, now am I dead. And yet he's still talking. My soul is in the sky, and yet he's still talking. Tongue, lose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. Now, die, 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 die. <laughs> in every production I've seen, the audience is just laughing like crazy. Okay. So we hear Demetrius and Lysander and others talk, and then Thisbe comes in, and she sees him, you know, what did my daughter? Bear in mind, Thisbe is played by a young man. 
speak, speak, cry to him, dead, dead, et cetera, et cetera, and she kills herself. So, bottom S, do you want an epilogue? And they're like, no, please God, no. It's so they leave, and Puck comes back. And if you ever saw Dead Poets Society, famous scene with Ethan Hawke, a very young Ethan Hawke, like 12, 13 years old, okay? Because he's playing Puck. Now the hungry lion roars and wolf, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Over on Titania come in. They tell us what they're going to do. They send the fairies around the rooms of the castle or of the court to bless all the rooms. Theseus, excuse me, Titania and Oberon are going to bless Theseus and Hippolyta's marriage bed. And we hear what kind of blessing they give. To the best bride bed, line 398, will we which by us shall blessed be, and the issue there create ever shall be fortunate. So shall all the couples three ever true and loving be, and the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand. Never mole, harlot, nor scar, nor mark prodigious such as are despised in nativity shall upon their children be. Their children will be blessed with no birthmarks, no deformities, no problems. Okay? They leave, Puck's left. Puck gets the epilogue. If we shadows have offended, if it's subjunctive, okay? If we uh, shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. If anything in this play has bothered you, why a dream? What could be bothersome? What could be troubling to an audience? Portrayal of royalty, portrayal of dukes and such, some of the ideas, some of this. <clears throat> Think that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme, why is it weak and idle? No more yielding but a dream. That's why. Gentles, do not reprehend. Gentles, the audience, Gentles, literally, are the people sitting in the seats, not the groundlings, okay? If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if, is he an honest puck? <laughs> are all his errors honestly made? And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck now to escape the serpent's tongue, what's the serpent's tongue? Shakespeare's day, it wasn't boo, it was sss. That was an indication the play was not a success. We will make amends our long else the puck of our call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends. Cue the applause light above the stage. Okay? And Robin shall restore amends. And they get the applause and everybody leaves. And what is the net effect? We have a nice little diversion. Two and a half hours, three hours, take you away from the problems. And at the same time, because of how Shakespeare creates all of his plays, even the most ridiculous ones, like Comedy of Errors. There's a great Comedy of Errors, by the way. I think it's on YouTube. It was Robert Dal Roger Daltrey, the who? Playing the two, one set of the twins. Okay? It's one of Shakespeare's earliest plays. It's all about mistaken identity. Right? He's raising issues that he wants to plant in his audience's mind. Why? Because he'll sit there until a situation arises that will make somebody think about hmm, substance, accidents. You know, I, when talking about the background, to the 16th, 17th century. I had written right over here somewhere, real presence. And I was talking about the, the Eucharist, the communion meal. It was a debate that people literally died over. Was the body of Christ really in that bread and his blood really in that wine? Or is that just an image? Is it the accident or the substance? See, I mean, this terminology, this language can be, in Shakespeare's day, could be life or death. Okay.
Um, since today we're supposed to finish as you like it, we'll go ahead and start as you like it on Thursday. I don't know if you saw the email I sent out yesterday, but I screwed up over the weekend by not making visible for you the quiz that was due Sunday night, I think it was. So I opened that yesterday. I think. Why did you open it? Did, did, did we email it to you guys? Because cause there, was, there was the extra credit one and then there yep. was the other one. Yeah. And then okay, I, I might be confused then. Because I might be thinking of my next class, but I thought it was this uh, this class and I saw that nobody had taken it. <laughs> no, and it, was, it was my fault. You couldn't see it. I was I was worried because I I was I was like checking through like the details to make sure I didn't forget anything. I was like, oh no, I missed a quiz. Okay, okay. well just check it. And I'll check it when I get home. In, anyways, I said because I did that, I would open it until tomorrow night. Push the. Sorry, I am thinking of my other class. I've got my classes all mixed up. All right, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm thinking of my next class. I've got three of the same class and doing them on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and another one Tuesday, Thursday, and trying to keep them lined up is too much, yeah, and too much for my old